Hello everyone and welcome uh, on this Insta Live today and we're gonna talk about um, how we can make environmental, environmental education accessible and um, we're just gonna wait for a couple minutes as we get our special speaker for the day to get us going. Um, my guest to join. Allow me to introduce myself. So my name is Kaluki Paul Mutuku, and on behalf of um, in Landscapes, hi, come in. Hi, hi, Paul. Hi, Riley. Hi, welcome. So on behalf of the Youth in Landscapes and the Global Landscapes Forum, we are sending out a huge welcome to all of you who are joining us today. And Youth in Landscapes um, is teaming up with Global Landscapes Forum to create youth-led episodes for GLF Live uh, to share with the world a wonderful projects and initiatives that young people are actually doing from across across the world. And today we are super happy to collaborate with Ruth and Schutz, uh, an international youth program created three years, uh, three decades ago rather, by Dr. Jane Goodall, with a vision to support, inspire, and bring together youth uh, from preschool to university age to work on environmental conservation and humanitarian issues globally. So now let me invite uh, Camille on the screen. She's already on the screen. <laughs> so I'm um, so excited to have you here. Um, and Camille is currently pursuing her bachelor's degree at the University of California, Berkeley, majoring on molecular environmental biology with an emphasis in animal health and behavior. Wow. She has been working with roots and shoots for five years. So I'm sure she will really have some amazing insights um, to share. So welcome again, Kami, and it's so nice to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Indeed, indeed, and, and, and what an amazing way to join from Africa and join from the US and have so many people join from across the world, right? Yes, so excited <laughs> everyone here. Yeah, so yeah, why don't we get right to it? Um, understand, Kami, you've been involved in this field for many, many years, ever since you were about six years old, yeah? So to start us off, could you kindly tell us a bit about yourself and how you developed interest in these topics in such a young age? Totally. I became passionate, I think, about the environment when I started Girl Scouts. So I joined about six years old, around in kindergarten. So I started at a young age, and I've always loved, I've always had a passion and love the outdoors um, and making a difference in my community and I've always loved animals. Um, as I grew older, I started getting more concerned about the negative effects that we're having on the planet right now. And I was wondering, what can I do to do my part and to change this narrative and like to change the future? So I ended up coming across the Roots and Truths organization in my high school from my English teacher. And I found this to be my outlet to develop all my passions into projects and into action. And I've been involved in Roots and Shoots ever since. And this has led me to the career path and the school that I'm at right now. Wow, so amazing, so amazing what young people can do. And just a reminder, those of us who are joining, please um, keep sending in your, your questions that you have for Kami on the chat. And we have some time towards the end of this session to um, ask them. And just following on what you just said, um, Kami, now that you're here representing Roots and Shoots, could you maybe describe the program in a nutshell and, you know, the impact it has had on your community? Yeah, so Roots and Shoots, in a nutshell, is the program of the Jane Goodall Institute. So it was founded by Dr. Jane Goodall, and it's a global movement of youth-inspired and motivated, to, motivated motivation to create change in their communities and to just make more compassionate decisions in their everyday life. And many of these Roots and Shoots groups are typically started by youth and young people in their local communities where they can come together to create projects that they are passionate about. In my community, this program has definitely shifted the way that my city government, as well as my high school, definitely acts about the environment around um, this organization. And I was so amazed to like, always see like the openness my high school was to change, which um, whenever I wanted to do something, um, my campaigns in the community. And I also, for me, I definitely wouldn't be the person that 
I am today if it weren't for this organization. It's taught me so many leadership skills and just how to be overall a strong leader and organized person in my community. And it's taught me how to organize very large events. Um, it's also taught me how to have large influence over many people. And it's given me the passion for animals and primatology, which is like what I'm studying right now. And I hope that I'll be able to advocate similarly to Jane on a larger level for the wild animals and environmental protection. Indeed, and I definitely wish you well. You're really on the right steps and, and the right path for that and can only wish you well for the future. Um, and then just following up, uh, I mean, could you tell us a bit about the project that you have been running with Roots and Shoots, um, of course, and then their impacts? Yeah, so throughout high school, I've created a, a large amount of projects educating other youth on the environmental impacts that humans are having on the world. And I'd say largely success in projects is a large part due to community involvement and the involvement of other students. Um, through these projects, I learned like the true value of collaborating and community engagement. So some of my smaller projects, which are great examples that youth can do today are community cleanups. And these were always very impactful on my community just because a large turnout would always come to these events and volunteers then could actually realize and, and see the impacts that pollution is having on like local ecosystems and the communities around them because it's mm -hmm. having some disastrous effects. And I think what I love about these projects is that they're so small, but a small project has so much power in a community because they really make the biggest difference locally and they provide inspiration for further and future change. Um, mm -hmm. Another example of a project that I did in the past were some environmental seminars um, for students at my school to learn about the effects that we're having on the environment also. So I would invite local businesses to talk about their uh, nonprofit work. So for example, one was talking about poison bait boxes, which is like anticoagulant rodenticides. And they're used to kill rodents, but they're really harmful on the food chain in our ecosystem in the community. And they're actually impactful on also dogs and cats. So that's something that's personal to people that they can relate to, to actually care about this topic because people may not care at first, but I think these seminars were always so important because these people had such knowledgeable, valuable knowledge to share. And, and Roots and Shoots really cares about the importance of like grassroots activism within local communities. Wow, wow. <laughs> I think every time you're speaking, you're like exposing me to so much. And of course, everyone else is joining to so much about what Truth and Truth is doing. And so that's so amazing. And um, just before we continue, if Camille can move your camera a bit so that it's not, you're not too low on the screen. Yes, that yes, yes. <laughs> Almost. Yes. Good? Okay. Good. Yes, um, and actually, this gets us to an exciting uh, segment. Like you've run both uh, projects for other youth yourself, but also, um, you know, you've also participated in programs um, as a young person. And I know that does not come without any challenges, right? So, um, do you mind also sharing with us, like, what are some of the challenges you faced as a youth, um, you know, running programs, but also like a youth benefiting from these programs? Yeah, so as a creator, definitely making projects that are impactful and definitely engaging or interesting to other people, as I, I kind of mentioned um, a little earlier, is, is definitely hard because people may not necessarily be issue in the projects that you're really passionate about. So you have to try to almost convince the greater public why they should care about the project that you want to do. Um, I know another project that I did in the past was on invasive like plants and removing them. And I know that that was something that really, uh, like people didn't really care so much about removing pl invasive plants. Like why should I go get my hands dirty and pick out weeds all day? But actually like you can try to convince them by saying, well, by cleaning up these invasive plants in your community, it increases the biodiversity, it increases the wildlife and more native plants and it, it beautifies the area in the long run. And people might actually care about that because it's their community and they might want it to look more beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. As a creator and as a young person participating in other programs, um, 
I think I could speak for everyone that it's definitely hard to make your voice heard among older people as a young adult um, or as a youth, even younger. Um, it could be hard because maybe adults are more outspoken or more set in their old ways and they don't really want to change and they don't really want to listen to a young person because we're not as knowledgeable. Um, they've been, they've been around longer, they know more. Um, so being the youngest, like at the table, you have to work a lot harder and to show that you have the knowledge and the drive to be included. And I think there's definitely times when you don't feel like you're good enough to be a part of certain groups or conversations. And it can be really hard to be young, but so passionate about topics that are directly affecting you and older people don't really see the issues right in front of them because it's directly impact impacting us and not really impacting them as much as it is impacting us. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't agree with you more. And I think just to, I mean, just cement it and, and add a bit of my reflections on the same that as young people and youth, youth movements, at times we find the challenge that um, you know, at times people don't believe in us. I mean, they think we're too naive or we, we cannot be trusted with responsibilities and power. But I actually think if you look across some of the youth movements coming up and youth individuals themselves that are doing so much to change this environmental crisis, the climate crisis itself. And so that in itself can really help world leaders see the potential in young people that don't make it hard for us to, you know, advocate and act on nature and the climate system. Give us the right platforms, give us the right uh, resources, give us the opportunity to also be on the table, meaningfully so to engage. So, I mean, uh, thank you so much for those re reflections of coming. And just um, as we continue, um, what do you think is the role of global programs like Ruth and Shoots uh, or networks like Youth in Landscapes really? in tackling global environment and social challenges today? I believe that the role of Roots and Shoots and uh, Youth and Landscapes is definitely impacting local communities. I've said it maybe a million times, but local is like the way to start grassroots change and building these networks all around the world to make an even, even bigger difference. Um, Roots and Shoots definitely empowers like young change makers to stand up for what they believe in and encourages the youth to start thinking more creatively about how they can make a real difference on the planet. It also allows for young people to connect with one another around the globe and it definitely fonts the, sorry, <laughs> fosters a sense of community um, on similar interests and passions and so through the access of like all these resources that Youth and Landscapes and Roots and Shoots is able to like give youth, they can develop their passions into action and take the first steps to make a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I, I think just going back again to, um, you know, an issue that we touched on a bit about challenges that youth organizations and youth themselves, we are facing, let me not say themselves, ourselves are facing, right? Uh, but just, I mean, not all other groups are actually against us or anything. So I'm just wondering um, uh, your perspectives around how older generations can actually, and global institutions can support young people. Um, in developing the restoration and conservation projects? I think this definitely ties back into like what I was saying about the older generation and having a seat for us at the table. I think that they need to start incorporating young people into the decisions that they're making with any decision, like in any aspect of the environment related, human related, plant related, animal related, et cetera, any of all of the above. Um, too often like, the youth like perspective is left out completely and it doesn't really make sense because again like these these decisions are impacting us more than it's impacting them and the current state of like the environment right now and the climate has definitely been a consequence of all the unsustainable practices that these businesses and etc are making for like short-term profits and the damage is starting to be done, but there's a lot we still can undo. And I think that youth have this unique perspective because we're the ones who have to deal with the consequences in the future. And I think that if older generations and institutions start taking this into account and taking our voice into account um, early, earlier in the decision process, um, 
will be able to support, they will actually be able to support our projects, our restoration that we're so passionate about. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and actually I agree with you and actually also the fact that young people are, you know, quite out the numbers when you look at the global uh, population statistics for young people, we actually many, we also are very energetic people, we are creative and so, I mean, it's only in the interest of other uh, groups to actually work with young people to drive the agenda that we need for restoration and climate action. So, I mean, <laughs> so amazing, so amazing. And just to remind uh, all of us again, please, um, we are hosting uh, Kami uh, from Roots and Shoots, and today we're just covering the topic on how we can make environmental education um, accessible. And you can already hear the amazing insights we're getting from this young lady. And, and I mean, uh, I cannot hear to go deeper into this and learn more about you, Kami. And just to get deeper, uh, more into the education bit of this, you know, and building a better future. What then do you think is the role of environmental education um, for raising generations that uh, caring about our planet? So the role of environmental education definitely radiates through Jane Goodall's mission and her organization. And she, Jane Goodall has many famous quotes, but I think this really symbolizes like this whole question. And she says, only if we understand, can we care? Only if we care, we will help. And only if we help, we shall be saved. And I think by making space for environmental curriculums in classrooms or in the home setting or in clubs means helping the youth understand um, the natural world and the animals that we share with it and the interconnectedness of people, animals, and the environment and our duty to protect these fragile, the fragile earth and ecosystems that come with it. I think mm -hmm. Roots and Truth also recognizes leaders from all different backgrounds. They, they really hold the keys to shaping the culture and direction like of the world that we all share. Um, I know that also emphasizes nine traits of compassionate like, leaders. Um, and like a few are like acts with purpose, thinks critically and um, being a team player. And there's, there's many more, I could list them, but there's a lot. <laughs> and I think in a world where too often, like a lot of people are just turning to apathy and disengagement um, in the face of uh, major global issues, it's more important than ever that we change the ways we make decisions and act for people. And I think Roots and Shoots is amazing because they really hone on these traits in youth so that when they're ready to rise in the leadership roles um, in their own lives or in their community, they're ready to make these decisions that are more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. I agree with you and they're already like what you're already doing at Roots, uh, Roots and Shoots, uh, what is already happening at the youth in landscape, I know Youth for Nature and many other youth organizations are leading on, you know, environmental education programs which are highly needed. Uh, so then um, the follow-up question is, now how can we make this um, environmental education accessible? I mean, exa with examples on now to get young people more interested and engaged in uh, environmental education as a teacher yourself, as a parent, or even as a sibling anywhere in the world. And then maybe a second bit to that would be if you have any specific advice, especially around uh, this COVID era and how we can, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of the dig digital platforms to make it accessible for everyone. So I think what I love about the Roots and Truths organization is how they help guide young people through a process that helps them identify what they're truly passionate about. And I think that the difference between an adult telling a group, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do X, Y, Z. This is our project and lay it out for them versus allowing for young people to explore their communities at a young age and different subjects to decide for themselves how they want to use their voice and, and make the differences and changes is, is very drastic and very incredible. Um, with COVID, definitely Roots and Shoots has adapted a lot of their materials for familial use who are social distancing, homeschooling, um, or teachers who are teaching remote classes because it's very difficult to meet, meet in person right now. Um, so for example, like there are many family toolkits available on the Roots and Shoots website that can help youth with service projects, um, that can give them resources. There's many schedules on the Roots and Shoots with activities to do. 
um, and community mapping lessons, which is super cool. There's a free GIS uh, resource tool that you can also learn how to use on the Roots and Shoots website. Um, mm -hmm. Also, many inspiring young leaders and members from the National Youth Leadership Council, as well as um, just other Roots and Shoots members around the globe who have been creatively adapting their projects and that are highlighted on the Roots and Shoots website. Um, my good friend Maddie, who's on the NYLC, had created a project that is helping spread awareness about sustaining the honeybee population. And it's called the Thrive Bee Project. And she has been using social media amazingly. She is a social media queen and sharing her campaign online as well as she created her own, sorry if it's a little loud, created her own video um, on how to build her own, build your own bee hotel at home, which is super cool. And I think this is a great way of like a Roots and Shoots project that can be done while, you know, safely social distancing in your own home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that aspect of, you know, experiential learning and just starting simple and, you know, with what is workable, I do think that is a very like amazing place to start. And, and you know, of course, again, just taking out the resources at Roots and Shoots and at the youth organizations that are leading on, uh, I think, and from education, that would be a very good place also to get, uh, you know, such ways on how you can engage, uh, you know, on environmental education accessibly, so, right? Um, and it brings us to an amazing segment where now we want to hear from the audience and everyone who's joining us. By the way, thank you for keeping up with us and, and sticking in for this amazing conversation. And come here and let you know that you have some very amazing questions coming. And first up uh, for you, um, what have you learned about yourself over the years as you've done your projects? Something I've learned, that's a really great question um i definitely learned that i learned a lot about patience with people and if you're being quick to being quick to jump to assumptions or being quick to judge i've definitely become a lot more patient because sometimes i want my projects to go a certain way or i work with people that are a little bit there's more conflict and we may not agree on everything but i think by i think i've learned a lot about being more patient with that and just taking things slow and knowing that everything's going to work out in the end and that whatever you're doing, you're going to make a difference because as long as you're, you have an end goal and you all have the same end goal, then you know you're going to make a difference like in the end. So I've definitely learned a lot about being patient with myself, being patient with older people has definitely been something I've learned about a lot too. Exactly. And the fact that, you know, we are here for a reason and, you know, your life is not for granted. Thank you for that uh, perspective. The next question coming up uh, for you again is, um, you know, what are your suggestions? What is a suggestion you have for young people trying to make a difference and have their voices heard um, by adults they are working with or surrounded by? So what, uh, you know, your suggestion would be for them? A suggestion I have would be never, never give up, never stop trying. You might get shot down the first time, but a great example of this, and, and she's not a young person, but Jane Goodall, who she's incredible. Like she'll talk to politicians that are just not on the same side of her at all, but she just has a very, she talks to them in a very calm way. She uses stories that make them feel more personal um, and she doesn't, you know, yell at them or anything. And I think by acting calmly, but also being confident in yourself and knowing that what you're saying is right, whether the outcome of that conversation is going to come out the way you want it to, knowing that you're going into it with confidence and knowing that what you're doing is the right thing, you will, you'll get something out of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is some youth power, right? And, you know, just being as uh, calm as a dove, but as wise as a serpent. I mean, that, that's okay. Um, and another interesting one here. What has been your favorite project that you've worked on so far? My favorite project? I think my favorite project would have to be um, in back in high school, I planted a garden at my school in the front of campus and I think it took like two months to do so it was like really quick and 
I didn't run into any barriers at the school. They kind of just like, yeah, go for it. You can do what you want. Like, your roots and shoots. We know you. And I just thought that was so cool because I've always like run into obstacles with my projects, being able to like plant like the city. Is it allowed? What kind of plants are we planting? Um, and um, I think that's something that a lot of people can run into and you almost feel stuck when you have, when you run into like those kinds of um, obstacles, like with your projects and you almost feel defeated, but it's all worth it. Cause one day you're going to get a really amazing project and you're going to, it's going to go perfectly. And you're going to be so proud of like all the work you've done. And I know that that garden is still thriving today because I have some friends that have taken pictures and sent them to me. So it's definitely worth it. It's all worth it. And I actually wish or hope that you can send me one of those amazing pictures. I feel it sounds like a very amazing project so far. So thanks for that, what you've been able to do and the sustainability aspect of that. And someone else is asking um, how we as youth can work for environmental justice. I know you might have answered, but maybe if you can just rephrase it for someone here. Yeah. What was the question? Sorry. How, how we as youth can work for environmental justice. Yes, that's a really... That's a really good question because that's another big issue that we really need to start focusing on is how environmental issues and climate are affecting um, very disproportionate and minority communities, especially like in my own, in my own city, um, I'm in Berkeley and it definitely affects the people in Richmond, certain areas of San Francisco that are more lower income because they're more, they're closer to um, polluted plants and that's a that's a very big issue because um, we need to start doing something about environmental justice. And I guess how you can work is start actively learning about the things in your community or your hometown and then start re doing some research and making sure that your voice is heard and you don't and don't stop. Keep pushing for reform, more policy um, and just change so that all people are able to live in like a sustainable and beautiful world with clean water, clean air, everything. Yeah, yeah. And actually around the same question on intersectionality, actually this is a question that I just come and I think it just went ahead of your time, which is amazing. <laughs> As someone was actually asking um, how we can include more voices in the environmental movement, you know, from young women, uh, from global south and from indigenous youth. Totally. I think that's a great question also. Um, I can speak a little bit on like young women who feel that they aren't smart enough or good enough to be in STEM fields or the science field. Um, I know that was something that I felt as a young woman. I, I just felt like maybe I'm not really smart enough to be learning a science or being in STEM um, or being a scientist or et cetera when I'm older. Um, and I think that something that I wish someone told me is that, no, you definitely can do it. You are so smart. You deserve a seat at the table. We, meet, we need more young women that want to be scientists and want to be like Jane Goodall because it's so important. We have such a unique role to play. Um, in regards to also indigenous youth, definitely they all deserve a seat at the table. They deserve to learn and educate themselves as everyone else is i think their voices are very unique also because they have a, they come from a more sustainable sustainable um uh educational background um how they live very sustainably is really important i think we really need to start learning from them because they have a lot they can teach us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. indeed indeed everyone has a lot that they can teach each other you know so you just have to trust uh, the process and uh, give confidence in everyone uh, in what we are doing. And um, a more, I think, uh, a passionate question with empathy. Someone is asking, and that, you know, you spoke of apathy, uh, apathy, rather, and not just caring. So then what are some of the ideas you might suggest for those, for those that aren't so sure about getting involved? Uh, what are some fun, small ways to start? <laughs> totally. I would say it doesn't ever hurt to try to get involved. Even if you don't like it, you can always take a step back. Um, the Roots and Truths doesn't judge, you know, you can, you do you. Some fun small ways to start is probably finding what you're passionate about and then 
making a small project or even a little campaign about what you want to do about it. Um, a, f a small way, let's say you're really into frogs. I know I have a lot of friends that love frogs. Um, if you're a little kid and you're like, oh, I really like frogs, but like they're actually endangered and a lot of them are endangered and there's a big issue going on with um, diseases that are affecting some of them in the wild. So what you could do is you could do maybe a little research about it and create a little post on social media, or you can create an Instagram account and post like every day, you could post a picture of a frog and be like, this is this frog and this is a species and, and little things like that. That's even a very like smaller, but broader project. That's um, a great way that you can start and you can almost educate yourself on like everything for that. Um, another thing you could do is also doing a cleanup. That's also very simple. You could do it anytime, any day. Um, you could do it in your community. You'd be surprised how much you're going to actually end up picking up anywhere. <laughs> Indeed, you're your only limitation and you're your only um, potential when it comes to change. Thank you so much, Kami. Actually, as we come to um, an end with this, our uh, I'm wondering what, what are your hopes um, for the next decade regarding the state of our planet? My hope for the next decade, taking into consideration like the state of our planet, is that, again, like, like Jane says, every individual matters, every individual has a role to play, and every individual makes a difference. And this quote, I, I really believe that we have the power and as Jane says, indomitable human spirit to change the direction that we're heading in to make a very, a more sustainable future for people, animals, and the environment. And I know that in the current state we're in, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I have a lot of hope in the youth generation that I'm a part of and that you're a part of because there's so many passionate individuals that I've met who really care and are willing to advocate for a, a better future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed, and I don't want to make it any less uh, diluted because you really make it so conk. And I think for me, it's just similar like hopes for the next decade and really just hoping that um, the world will look at young people, they will look at um, the global south, they will look at um, indigenous groups and other stakeholders and bring them to the table and actually lead the decade of ecological restoration because we need all hands on deck, but more importantly, we need meaningful action. And so through actions like, uh, you know, roots and shoots, uh, youth in landscapes, youth for nature, um, global evergreening alliance, and so many other movements, we can actually drive the solutions from local to global levels. So really, uh, thanks so much to Ruth and Schutz at uh, the Jen Goodell Foundation. Thanks to Global Landscapes Forum and Youth in Landscapes Initiative for this amazing opportunity. And most of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Kami, for this discussion and our amazing audience for tuning in and posing those very tough questions that apparently Kami has been so kind enough to uh, answer. So thank you so much and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.